Hello everyone, I'm Susan Saravo, and today I'm joined by Frank Jennings, Senior Wealth Planner with Comerica Wealth Management. Welcome, Frank. Thank you, Susan. Glad to join you. Great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about your role with Comerica Wealth Management. Right, so with Comerica Private Wealth Management, I'm a Senior Wealth Planner. Um, I've got eight years of experience in private banking, private wealth management. My background is um, based in certified financial planning, so I'm a certified financial planner and I have a legal background as well. Um, so I work with clients and their families to help them structure their estates and review their current estate plans in a manner that matches their goals and objectives. Awesome. Well, today we're going to be talking about hobby losses, important items to understand. And before we get into the discussion, tell us about what are some of these expensive hobbies? Yeah, so a couple of examples that we have for activities that have been found to be subject to the hobby loss rules include auto racing, horse breeding, fishing, and golfing. Now, those four examples are part of a much broader class of activities that have been found to be hobbies, but it's important to remember that determining whether an activity is engaged in for profit or as a hobby is a very fact-intensive inquiry. So it's gonna be based on the taxpayer at hand, how they maintain the activity, how they uh, keep records and things of that sort. It's also important to understand that an activity where one taxpayer is found to uh, be engaged in a hobby doesn't necessarily mean a different taxpayer operating differently would also be found to be engaged in a hobby. Classic example is, you know, if Tiger Woods is golfing, that's not necessarily a hobby when compared to, you know, a normal person who's just golfing on the weekends with friends. Good distinctions there. Appreciate you telling us that. So let's talk about what are some of the key takeaways for people who watch this video. Yeah, so the key takeaways uh, that I have are section 183 of the Internal Revenue Code is where you'll find the rules pertaining to hobby losses. It's important to remember that hobby losses are um, very fact intensive and taxpayer specific. So you need to look at the facts and circumstances uh, surrounding the situation that the taxpayer is engaged in, and it can change from taxpayer to taxpayer. Also, it's more important than ever to establish a profit motive with the recent changes with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And we'll touch on that a little bit more later. Okay, before we get to profit motive, tell us more about who would be subject to these rules. Right, so basically any individual or entity apart from C corporations is gonna be covered by the hobby loss rules. So the Internal Revenue Service put together in a treasury regulation um, an exemption for C corporations. So they're not covered by the hobby loss rules. And it's important to understand that for the application of the hobby loss rules, determining whether a profit motive or stated differently, a profit intent exists is pretty much the main thing that the Internal Revenue Service and tax court will be looking at. Hey Frank, what are the profit motive factors specifically? Right. On the slide, you'll see that we have uh, nine factors that are established by the Internal Revenue Service and the more specifically Treasury regulations. We'll touch on three today, but before we uh, dive into those three, it's important to understand that these factors are not weighted equally. So if there's a lot of evidence in favor of one factor, that can outweigh several factors that don't have as much evidence one way or the other. And it's also important to understand that more evidentiary weight is given to objective facts than mere statements of intent. So if a taxpayer says, look, I really wanted to turn a profit with this, I'm engaged in this activity for profit, that's my intention, that won't hold as much weight as if they were to produce a set of separate books and records evidencing the fact that they're maintaining this as a standalone for profit endeavor. So those are kind of you know big picture overarching things to remember. Today we'll discuss three of the nine factors. The first factor we'll discuss is did the taxpayer conduct the activity in a business-like manner? So act examples uh, in support of this are did the taxpayer maintain separate accounts and books um, separate and distinct from their individual accounts and records associated with the activity? Additionally, uh, attempts to increase revenue or lower expenses or cost um, find in favor of a profit activity, um, because really that shows that the taxpayer was conscious about generating a profit with the activity. And, you know, the court has said before, um, because taxpayers had no system to monitor expenses or losses, 
there was no way that they could make informed business decisions. So really that helps you understand that the tax court is really concerned with whether or not the taxpayer is engaged in a for-profit activity and having a separate set of books and records is a means by which they can determine whether or not they're uh, profitable in said activity. The second factor we'll discuss today is the time and effort expended on the activity. So this uh, is where the court will look to see how much time are you actually engaged in the activity? Is this something you do on weekends or when you have free time? Or does this consume a lot of your life? Is this something that you're engaged in full time? However, it's important to note that depending on the activity, the amount of time can deviate. So for instance, a, a pretty commonly quoted court case is dealing with a pilot who uh, performed in air shows and specifically it was a stunt pilot doing dangerous maneuvers and activities and the court can be quoted as saying given the dangerous nature of the activity we cannot say that a petitioner devoted an insignificant amount of time and effort to the activity so here the taxpayer had only been engaged in the activity for 80 hours in a year they had participated in three air shows and the court still found that, that was sufficient time for the activity or for this factor to be in favor of finding a profit intent or motive. The third uh, factor we're going to look at today is the taxpayer's financial status. So really, the court's looking to see, do you have other means available to you to support your lifestyle? So do you have a wage earning job where you get paid a significant amount of money? Or do you have you know, a large nest egg that you could support yourself off of? In the legislative history, the court or the actual uh, legislature can be quoted as saying as a poor person engaged in what appears to be an inefficient farming operation is not what they intend to regulate with the hobby loss rules. So just because a business or an activity is engaged in, in an inefficient manner, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not for profit. Okay. That's an interesting, interesting note there, Frank. How about establishing an existence of a profit motive? How do you do that? Right. So once it's determined if a profit motive exists or does not exist, um, there's essentially like a decision tree. So let's start with if there's the determination that there is no profit motive, then the hobby loss rules kick in. They'll be applied to your situation and you will not be able to deduct expenses incurred in the activity. Now, as we talked about before, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made changes um, to whether or not you could deduct expenses. Before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, it was possible to claim expenses as miscellaneous itemized deductions, and those were going to be subject to AGI limitations. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act provisions are set to expire on 2025, so more to come on that as to whether or not we'll revert to that standard. But as the law currently sits, you cannot uh, deduct any expenses engaged in, in a pro uh, an activity that's engaged in with no profit motive. However, you will have to claim any income generated by the activity in your AGI. So that can be pretty detrimental if it's determined that there's no profit motive. Now on the other side, flip motive, uh, if a profit motive exists, the expenses are then deductible and really it's going to be under one of two code sections. So they're either going to be deductible under 162 as trade or business expenses or alternatively under section 212 as expenses for the production of income. So those are kind of the two outcomes that you'll have, whether or not there's a profit motive. Frank, you covered a lot of details in this video. Give us your final thoughts. Just summarize uh, what you said to us today. Yeah, so the hobby loss rules can be very challenging to navigate. And it's really important to engage your tax and legal professionals if you have any questions as to whether or not you're in compliance or whether or not you've established a profit motive. If you have additional questions, we will make a link available to a paper that we put together with more detail about the hobby loss rules and with a summary of all nine factors. So as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the wealth strategist on your relationship or your wealth relationship manager. Great information, Frank. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it.